Hello, my name is Joe Sosnowski. We are continuing our study of the Word in the Hellenistic world. I've included some contact information for myself. PowerPoint handouts are available by email for each of these lectures. Now let's begin with the Holy Spirit prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The theme for this semester is Judaism in the Hellenistic World. This week we will study the book of Judith. Judith is a Jewish heroine who saved Jerusalem from the Assyrian army by cutting off the head of the Assyrian general Holofernes. This is a mosaic of Judith in the church of the Dormition in Jerusalem. The name of the church, Church of the Dormition, is taken from the Latin word Dormition for sleep. In the Catholic tradition, we believe that Jesus' mother, Mary, when she came to the end of her earthly life, fell asleep and then was taken body and soul into heaven. In this church, above the statue of the sleeping Mary, there are six mosaics of famous women from the Old Testament. One of them is Judith. The others are Eve, Esther, Ruth, Jael, and Marion. Judith is one of the seven Catholic deuterocanonical books. The opening line from the book of Judith is, In the twelfth year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Assyrians, in the great city of Nineveh. Now, anyone familiar with the Old Testament would immediately know something is wrong. What's the problem? Well, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylonia, whose capital was Babylon. So the writer is tipping you off right at the start that they are not going to give us a historical account. The style of the book is didactic fiction, a story whose purpose is to teach a moral lesson, not history. The historical inconsistencies are obvious. The ruling kingdom was at the time of the story Assyria, but the ruling king was Babylonian, and it occurs after the Israelites have returned from exile which was the time of the Persians, and it is written to the Israelites at the time of the Maccabean revolu uh, Revolution. Its literary style is didactic fiction, didactic meaning morally instructive. But even the historical inconsistencies are instructive. These are all periods when Israel was experiencing some form of oppression, and God has been there to save them. God is a God who saves. But the th central moral instructions are obedience leads to blessings, in this case deliverance from a vastly superior Assyrian army, and that deliverance comes from God's power, not human power. But it is God's power working through human beings who both pray and take actions that brings deliverance. God can't work through humans if they don't act. The heroine of the story is Judith. Judith means woman of Judah or Jewish. She personifies Israel. The setting is the fictional town of Bethulia that is strategically located north of Jerusalem. Bethulia comes from the Hebrew word for virgin and in the story represents Jerusalem. The book is divided into two main parts. In part one, the peril of the Jews chapters 1 through 7. In this, the story of King Echbenezer sends his general Holofernes to conquer the lands west of Assyria, including Israel. All the lands have fallen to Holofernes, and lastly he comes to Israel and prepares to attack with an overwhelming force. Humanly speaking, the Jews have no chance. The second part, Deliverance of the Jews, chapters 8 through 13, 8 through 16, tells the story of how Judith, through the power of God, Yahweh, delivers the Jews from General Holofernes. In the big picture, this is a battle between 
King Nebuchadnezzar, who thinks he is a god, acting through his general Holofernes, and Yahweh, who is God, acting through his servant Judith. The story is a battle between the true God, Yahweh, and the false God, Nebuchadnezzar. The background to the story is, King Nebuchadnezzar decides to go to war against Midia in the east. He solicits aid from his vassal states in the west. They all ignore his request. He defeats Media without their assistance and then decides to take revenge on all the states that refused his request for aid. He sends his general Holofernes against all these countries in revenge, and all the nations are defeated or voluntarily submit to him. And it's not just revenge. What he really wants is for them to acknowledge him as God. We read in chapter, chapter 3, verse 8, Nevertheless, he and this he is referring to General Holofernes, devastated their whole territory and cut down their sacred groves, for he had been commissioned to destroy all the gods of the earth so that every nation might worship Nebuchadnezzar alone and every people and tribe invoke him as God. Now this is something the Jews cannot do, acknowledge Nebuchadnezzar as God. They will have to fight. Holofernes' army is approaching Jerusalem from the north, and the Jews prepare for war. But the Jewish town of Bethulia is in a strategic location blocking Holofernes' way to Jerusalem. So first he will have to conquer Bethulia. Holofernes asks one of his allies, General Achior, what he, Achior, can tell him about the Jews. Achior tells Holofernes an abbreviated version of the Israelite people, how God has always saved them when they were obedient and punished them when they were disobedient. He tells him in chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, and I'm going to read that to you, chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. So now, my Lord and Master, if these people are at fault, and are sinning against their God. And if we verify this offense of theirs, then we shall be able to go up and conquer them. But if they are not a guilty nation, then your Lordship should keep his distance. Otherwise their Lord and God will shield them and we will become the laughing stock of the whole world. Holofernes doesn't accept this because Achior is implying that Yahweh is more powerful than King Nebuchadnezzar, who Holofernes thinks is a god. Holofernes banishes Achior to the Jewish town of Bethulia, which he is about to attack. In Bethulia, Achoria tells Bethulia's ruler Uzziah Holofernes' plans. Holofernes prepares for war against the Israelites. He begins his campaign by blockading the city and cutting off their water supply. After 34 days, all the reservoirs and cisterns have run dry, and the people are dying of thirst and are ready to surrender. Uzziah, the town ruler, convinces them to give God five more days to save them. Then he will surrender the city. This ends part one of the book of Judith, The Peril of the Jews. Note the chiastic structure, the center of the chiasm being the key theme, who is the true God. Then in part two, Deliverance of the Jews, we are introduced to Judith. She is a childless, young, well-to-do, pious widow. She is described as a very God-fearing woman. When Judith hears what Hosea has agreed to do, she calls him and the other leaders to a meeting and reads them the riot act. And we hear what she has to say in chapter 8, verses 11 to 16. Chapter 8, verses 11 to 16. When they came, she said to them, Listen to me, you rulers of the people of Bethulia, what you said to the people today is not proper. When you promised to hand over the city to our enemies at the end of five days, unless within that time the Lord comes to our aid, 
you interspose yourself between God and yourselves with this oath. Who are you then, that you should have put God to the test this day, setting yourselves in the place of God in human affairs? It is the Lord Almighty for whom you are laying down conditions. Will you never understand anything? You cannot plumb the depths of the human heart or grasp the workings of the human mind. How can you then fathom God, who has made all these things, discern his mind and understand his plan? No, my brothers, do not anger the Lord our God, for if he does not wish to come to our aid within the five days, he has it equally within his power to protect us at such time as he pleases, or to destroy us in the face of our enemies. It is not for you to make the Lord our God give surety for his plans. God is not man that he should be moved by threats, nor human that he may be given an ultimatum. Plus, she has a secret plan. That night, after she finished her prayers, we read in chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, which I will read to you, chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. After her prayers, she took off the sackcloth that she had on, laid aside the garments of her widowhood, washed her body with water, and anointed it with rich ointment. Then she arranged her hair and bound it with a fillet, and put on the festive attire she had worn while her husband Manaphis was living. She chose sandals for her feet, and put on her anklets, bracelets, rings, earrings, and all other jewelry. Thus she made herself very beautiful, to captivate the eyes of all the men who should see her. She leaves the city of Bethulia and crosses over the valley to the Assyrian camp, where she meets Holofernes and is given refuge because they, sh they think she is abandoning the city. On the fourth day, Holofernes hosts a banquet and invites Judith, and Judith replies, and we'll read chapter 12, verses 14 and following. Starting with chapter 12, verses 14 and following. Who am I to refuse my Lord? Whatever is pleasing to him I will promptly do. This will be a joy to me till the day of my death. Thereupon she proceeded to put on her festive garments and all her feminine adornments. Meanwhile her maid went ahead and spread out on the ground for her in front of Holofernes the fleece Agones had furnished her for daily use in reclining at her table. Then Judith came in and reclined on it. The heart of Holofernes was in rapture over her, and his spirit was shaken. He was burning with the desire to possess her, for she had been, for he had been biding his time to seduce her from the day he saw her. Holofernes said to her, Drink, and be merry with us. Judith replied, I will gladly drink, my lord. For at no time since I was born have I enjoyed life as much as I do today. She then took the things her maid had prepared, and ate and drank in his presence. Holofernes, charmed by her, drank a great quantity of wine, more than he had ever drunk on one single day in his life. When it grew late, his servants quickly withdrew. Bagones closed the tent from the outside and excluded the attendants from their master's presence. They went off to their beds, for they were all tired from the prolonged banquet. Judith was left alone in the tent with Holofernes, who lay prostrate on his bed, for he was sodden with wine. She had ordered her maid to stand outside the bedroom and wait, as on the other days, for her to come out. She said she would be going out for her prayer. To Begonus she had said this also. When all had departed, and no one, great or small, was left in the bedroom, Judith stood by Holofernes' bed and said within herself, O Lord, God of all might, in this hour look graciously on my undertaking for the exaltation of Jerusalem. Now is the time for aiding your heritage and for carrying out my design to shatter the enemies who have risen against us. She went to the bedpost near the head of Holofernes, and taking his sword from it, she drew close to the bed grasped the hair of his head, and said, 
Strengthen me this day, O God of Israel. Then with all her might she struck him twice in the neck and cut off his head. She rolled his body off the bed and took the canopy from its supports. Soon afterward she came out and handed over the head of Holofernes to her maid, who put it into her food pouch, and the two went off together as they were accustomed to do for prayer. She returns to the city of Bethulia with the head of Holofernes. The plan now is for the Israelites to attack their enemies, Holofernes' army. Judith knows that when the Assyrians realize that their leader has been killed by, quote, a single Hebrew woman, they will lose heart and be easily routed, which is exactly what happens. The book concludes with Judith leading Israel in a hymn of thanksgiving, then going back to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice and to celebrate. The moral of the story, obedience leads to blessings. One obedient, pious, faithful woman saves Bethulia and Jerusalem. It's always God's power, not human power, that saves. It is the power of God acting through a single woman, a person without political or military power. And prayer and action are required. All the people of Bethulia prayed, but it was Judith who prayed and also took action. God works through faith and action to save his people. The characters of Uzziah, the ruler of Bethulia, Judith, personify two opposite ways of relating to God. Uzziah is a man and represents human power, versus Judith, a woman who represents the powerless. Uzziah uses human wisdom. He evaluates the situation in Bethulia from a human perspective and decides it only makes sense to compromise, surrender, and throw yourself at the mercy of Holofernes. Whereas Judith has godly wisdom and knows compromise when it comes to God is never acceptable. Uzziah is a man of prayer, but not much in the way of action. Whereas Judith is a woman of prayer and action based on her trust in God. In the book of Judith, there are also many allusions to other Old Testament stories. Sometimes the allusions are explicit and sometimes implied. And here are some examples. The point is, God is a God of history. God has saved them in the past and will continue to save them now. And to finish, I like the way the Collegeville Commentary sums up the book of Judith. In the book of Judith, we learn... In the book of Judith, we learn that the whole army of Holofernes is defenseless against God's weapon, the beauty of a faithful woman. That concludes my lecture on Judith. Next week, lecture eight will be on the book of Daniel. Now let's finish with an Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.